Thank you. All right, well, so next I'm really pleased to introduce Omar Malik. He joined us at Campfire about four months ago and he is our director of camping. So uh, Omar is already making a big impact on our programming and our community. And so for the next few minutes, you'll hear from Omar and then you'll hear from Rick Taylor um, about how we're supporting our community, uh, how we plan to grow and adapt to the needs of our community. So next, sorry, I moved too far ahead. Next, I'll turn it over to Omar. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. Um, hello, everyone. Happy to be here. My name is Omar Malik, pronouns he, him. Um, like Kathy mentioned, been at camp just over four months, uh, very new to the community here, but really, really loving um, everything that I've seen so far, all the people that I've met so far, so very excited. A little bit about me, um, I was born in Pakistan. Um, I moved to the America when I was one years old, kind of bebopped around all over the country before when I was, but then when I turned 13, just before I turned 14, before I went to high school, my dad made the decision that we were all gonna move to Saudi Arabia. Um, got the opportunity to go out there in the beginning, did not love it so much, but as I kind of stayed there longer, um, really, really started to enjoy it. I got to go to international school, met, had went to school with 76 other different nationalities. It really shaped my view of the world. And I'm very grateful. Um, after I graduated from, from high school, I ended up going to London for college. Um, uh, once again, another place where I got to hang out in a multicultural place like London and really meet new people, meet new, meet new, um, have new experiences, and also really help shape the, the way that I, the way that I view the world. When I, when I graduated from there, I ended up going over to, uh, back to Saudi Arabia, where I got a job teaching at the same high school that I was working at. Um, and that's kind of where I fell in love with working with kids. I got to coach basketball, I got to teach history, and I kind of realized, I was like, hey, this is a path that I definitely want to take. Um, so I ended up going to California, Santa Clara University, to get my master's in teaching. Um, Really enjoyed my program, did not enjoy teaching. I very quickly realized that teaching was not the path for me. I really enjoyed the youth development aspect of what I, of, of working with kids, not so much the teaching them things that they don't particularly want to know about or care about sometimes. And so that, that was a, a switch that I made. I ended up going to the Boys and Girls Club to San Francisco where I ran a clubhouse um, in, in the Mission District in San Francisco. Um, where I really fell in love with youth development and 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 the work. Um, camping kind of snuck up on me. I knew I had a I had a kid who I worked with who had been you know for 355 days out of the year I'd work with this kid and it was like hitting my head against the wall almost every day. But then he would go to camp and he would go for 10 days and he would come back a different person. It was at that point that I was like, whatever is happening happening there is what I want to be a part of. So fast forward like six months, a job opened up in that organization and I got hired as a camp director, um, ran a summer camp in Mendocino County for about six and a half, seven years, really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I've been working in kind of out of school programming for the past 15 years. Um, my most important job, other than being a director of camping is being a uh, father uh, to my two-year-old daughter, Nadia, who you can see there in the picture, and my wife, Greta, who um, is a, has a homecoming because she is uh, moving back to her home state of Washington. Cool, next slide, please. So we're all here because we love Camp Seelth, right? Camp Seelth has a, has a place in many of our hearts um, and we only want to see it grow and get better. It's been serving youth for over a hundred years. And now the goal is how can we figure out a way to continue to serve our young people and all the families and the communities for a hundred plus more years. Next slide, please. Cool. So why does this all matter? So it's very clear. Um, it's very clear that nature can really, really help young people build well-rounded perspectives and improve a child's academic performance and critical thinking. There are plenty of studies that have been done on that. Um, and being able to offer kids a space in nature, especially a space as beautiful as Camp Sea Elf, um, can definitely improve a child's um, ability to learn and ability to create well-rounded perspectives on their own. Um, it's also very well noted that people of color are three times more likely than white people to live in places with limited access to nature. I can say for me personally, this is a huge thing. Um, I'm a man of color. I did not have access to nature growing up. A lot of the youth that I've worked with in the past have not had access to nature growing up. And so this was a big thing for me is how do we get young people who usually wouldn't have the opportunity to be at camp, the opportunity to be at camp. 
Further on from that, I think if COVID has taught us anything, um, the ability for young people to communicate with each other outside of a screen is something that a lot of people have forgotten. Um, especially as we come back out of the pandemic and we start to, to kind of see the effects of the pandemic, it's pretty clear that not being able to socialize with one another was one that really hurt our young people. And so being able to be in camp where there is no phones, there is no screens, there is just other young people that they want to be able to have conversation with really, really um, is something that I think is really unique to what camping offers, not only Camp Seattle, but what camping offers. Um, and then at camp, you get to meet a diverse group of people. You know, we have international staff who come from all over the world. We have people who come from all over America. We have campers who come from all over the state of Washington. And by the sounds of it, some people even come from outside of Washington. So being able to get the opportunity to, to meet people, make friends, um, really, really does make a huge difference um, in our young people's lives. So we really want to be able to continue to give that give that experience to people. I read a report that said if a person, if a young person has three or more caring adults in their life, they're 75% more likely to um to graduate from high school. Uh and camp provides that in 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 plentiful numbers with all the with all the counselors and staff that we hire. Next slide, please. Cool. So it's clear that the community needs us, right? Like we have been doing a lot of, we have been here in this community for a hundred plus years and they need us now more than ever. Um, more families want the, the experiences that we are able to provide. Um, it's kind of clear in the applications have increased 25% in the last year. Our wait list has increased 50% in the last year. And really the, the kicker here is that our scholarship requests have increased 200% in the last five years. Like I mentioned to me, it is a huge deal for me personally to be able to get young people from low income underserved communities out to camp. And in order to really be able to do that, we have to be able to um, you know, up our scholarship and we have to be able to you know, push our facilities forward to be able to have all of those people to be able to be here year round. Um, so really the main question that we start asking ourselves is what does it take for us to serve more kids? And to talk about that, I'd like to introduce our executive director, Rick Taylor, and he'll take us through the rest of the uh, rest of the presentation. Thank you, Omar. And uh, before I jump in, I just want to welcome Jeff Roberts to our call. He's our board chair uh, and he joined when Omar was talking. So uh, for the rest of the folks on the call, welcome, Jeff. Thanks, Rick. Good afternoon, everyone. All right. A little bit of my history. It's actually a little um, uh, overwhelming to think. Uh, 54 summers ago this summer, actually in a couple of weeks, um, I, it was my first summer at summer camp. Um, and so uh, every summer since then, I've been blessed by being able to spend a, uh, a summer or a part of the summer or the whole summer at camp. Um, and for the last 45 years, I've been working uh, in the camping uh, industry. Um, the first 30 years, uh, I was working in the YMCA system, um, running camps in Massachusetts, Arizona, Maryland, and Ohio. In 2008, we were in Ohio, and our youngest went off to college. Um, and uh, both my wife and I are from the East Coast. And we, at that point, said, you know, the Midwest is wonderful, but neither of us are really Midwesterners. And so um, the opening at uh, Camp Seattle and in Seattle was at that time. We came out to bash on and really fell in love with the place, as all of you who sort of got the opportunity to grow up here just knew what a special place it was. So for the last uh, 16 years, I've been blessed uh, to work and, and live on Vashon at Camp Seattle. Um, after spending almost 30 years in the Y system, what really um, just impressed me and excited me uh, about coming to Campfire was the fact that Campfire really walked its talk and put into practice every day um, the inclusivity um, and then as many of you who had children in the program know also the youth voice and youth choice, you know, that these uh, youth that we work with are encouraged and empowered to really take ownership of their experience with Campfire. And we have such a great um, concentration of uh, caring staff and volunteers who really sort of scaffold these kids on their journey. Um, for the last uh, 44 years, I've been blessed to be married to uh, my wife. Deb, and as I said, we live on uh, Camp Seattle with our Chocolate Lab Pippin. So very uh, happy to be here with you uh, and, and excited to be talking to you about, uh, you know, what the board 
um, and the staff and uh, key volunteers have been working on the last year or so as we try to envision the next century and what it could possibly be uh, at Camp Seattle. Um, so next slide, please. Um, as uh, many of you probably know, um, our last capital improvement campaign was in 2005. Um, the majority of that campaign went to wonderfully restore and protect Browns Hall. Um, unfortunately, that took a big chunk of it, and there were only about five or six buildings beyond that that were being able to, to touch at that time. Um, Browns Hall is our oldest building, um, and it is coming up on being 103 years old. Um, but beyond Browns Hall, Camp has 54 other buildings, and our median age of the facilities at Camp is 60 years old. So lots of wonderful buildings. Camp was just amazingly designed, you know, by the, the leaders and uh, the, the, the folks who started Camp, you know, over 100 years ago as this amazing summer camp. Um, where you really get a chance to live and be a part of nature and these amazing ecosystems. Um, but most of our buildings were built just for summer use. And the, while for the last 35, 40 years, we've been operating more than just in the summer, um, it's really been a Band-Aid approach. You know, we may throw a heater in a building, but we don't necessarily insulate it or, um, you know, put double pane windows or do any of those types of things. So we have this great summer facility, um, but uh, what could we do with it if we were able to, to really maximize uh, the property on a year-round basis? Um, and, you know, for most of the 100 years, you know, camp continues to host over 5,000 youth a year, and so that continues uh, to be uh, the case now. Um, you know, almost 60% of the folks we serve come in the months of June, July, and August. So um, very uh, summer focused, summer centric. And as you'll hear as we go on, we're trying to look for ways to sort of expand our reach and our outreach and take care of the, the wonderful facility that we've been blessed to, to inherit. So next slide, please. So we have a great opportunity in front of us as we begin our second century of serving youth in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we really are looking and have been working on about a year uh, on a plan to how we can renovate and upgrade Camp Seattle. Um, and then at the same time, we know we want to increase funding and opportunities uh, for scholarship and bringing um, new and more diverse populations into the outdoors. You know, especially, you know, you'll hear us talk about our equity access fund. Um, we still have a couple years of planning and permitting ahead of us, but we anticipate a multi-million dollar capital investment campaign with funding coming from our generous donors, foundations, and government's grants. So to talk a little bit about what we have um, sort of determined in uh, the first year of taking a deep dive into what we have and what we think we can be, uh, why don't we go to the next slide, Kathy? So this is just an overview of the um, uh, an earlier version, a drafts version of the site master plan. And I share it today, not to sort of uh, be able to look at it in detail, but just to show you that camp has 400 acres and we really see opportunities to develop and enhance the property on all 400 acres from the south end of the property to the north end of the property. Um, and um, that it's gonna be a phased approach. You know, with 55 plus buildings and the buildings that we want to upgrade, and the new buildings we want to add know that, you know, we envision this being a phase one, a phase two, a phase three. The team is working with the premise that, you know, what do we want? What is everything we could possibly envision needing uh, to get us through the next uh, 25 to 30 years? So um, the plan is sort of looking, what do we need now? But what do we also want to have, you know, down the road a little bit? Next slide, please. So this is a blow up of sort of one section of the property, um, really to show you, you know, it, as uh, as when we get the finished document, it's going to be color coded. You know, that orange color is going to be the existing buildings. So if you look up at Wrangler, um, our last uh, cabin focused new cabins 
um, was back in the early 90s. So Wrangler is our newest unit, but um, is uh, something that is still super functional. Uh, but we were going to take what's existing there at Wrangler and you see add some new facilities. And then if you look down along the water, you'll see um, uh, that, you know, plan to renovate many of the buildings on camp, you know, particularly what we have down there in Village. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have four main goals of the new site master plan. Um, the first one is to make camp more green and energy efficient. You know, we have these great facilities um, that were built for summer use, as I said. And so how can we take the ones like Village that we want to preserve, but make them more energy efficient and make them more accessible and uh, uh, you know respected of the, the natural environment that they're in. Um, the second piece is we want to make camp more accessible for people of all abilities. So using boardwalks and ramps and other opportunities to get people out of the main camp area into nature where we have opportunities to do that. So that's a key piece uh, behind this. Um, we also want to have the ability to run separate programs simultaneously um, in upper camp and lower camp, especially in the spring uh, and fall and winter months. Um, we see a lot of, uh, uh, you know, if we want to expand our use, it would be great to have same facilities, same opportunities. We have sort of an upper camp and lower camp. Um, and the one area that we do think there's um, ability to grow um, is in Wrangler and our riding programs. You know, we envision adding, you know, probably three more uh, cabins uh, to up our summer uh, capacity. But a big part of it is also we would love to incorporate uh, horses and riding program uh, year round, you know, looking at therapeutic riding opportunities and other opportunities to have horses here. Um, uh, camp CL is one of just two or three camps um, in the Pacific Northwest that still have riding programs, uh, unfortunately. Many of the camps in our area, for a lot of different reasons, um, have had to, to move away from riding programs. So that is something that we have a rich tradition with, and we want to build and expand upon. So next uh, slide, please. So why does this matter? Um, you know, camp is full in the summer. We could easily double the number of people who can experience Camp CL but this opportunity will be in the spring, in the fall, in the summer. We've been blessed um, the last three or four years with waiting lists, you know, for our summer programs. Um, we don't, you know, we serve when, it, when camp's full now. Our summer community is about almost 500 people, staff and volunteers and kids combined. Uh, that's a large size. That's a good size. You know, we're blessed that we have units and that we can sort of also program in smaller groups. But don't see a lot of actual growth in bed spaces, but we do want to take these wonderful facilities and make them more inviting on a year-round basis. Um, and a big part that's driving this is that to become trusted and engaged in our BIPOC communities, we need to start by engaging the entire family. Um, we, you know, we bring the whole family out to camp, um, and those opportunities are going to be in weekends in the spring and the fall or in the winter. You know, and then once we engage the whole family and get the whole family um, uh, trusting the staff uh, and the programs we have out here at camp, then that's going to open more opportunities to have those kids uh, trusted to be with us in the summer. So uh, a real strategy around opening up more opportunities to bring more diverse populations to camp on a year-round basis. Um, stewardship is a huge part of what uh, Camp Fire has always been about. And if we want to be sort of true responsible stewards, you know, of this amazing 400 acre resource that we have, there's just a lot of improvements we need to put into the property. So how do we make cabins green, energy efficient? You know, how do we work towards, you know, carbon neutrality and how we operate year round? And then how do we uh, protect the ecosystems that we have and provide responsible ways for uh, folks of all abilities to get into the outdoors? You know, and then the last point I'd like to make, uh, again, as we begin to bring in more diverse populations, we just want to ensure that everyone has safe and easy access into nature and the natural resources that we're blessed to have. So uh, with that, I am going to turn it back to Kathy. Great. Thank you, Rick. Um, so we're really just in the very early stages of planning. 
And we know it's important to gather feedback from our community. And this is going to help inform and shape our plan uh, to ensure that our beautiful camp and the programming is available for generations to come. And so you see here listed just some of the stakeholders that we will be engaging with. This meeting today is you know, a, a beginning um, part of this engagement, but we plan to talk to parents of campers, uh, campers themselves, um, our donors and supporters, our staff and you know just others in the community that um, have an interest in what we're offering here at camp. Um, 